So welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about the Thompson National Press today. It was down the end of Dean Avenue. Uh, one of my memories of Dean Avenue, uh, I, I was brought up on Dean Avenue, and at 5 o'clock sharp every night, the line of traffic would begin. All the, all the cars would line up. It was like a, a caravan of cars coming up the street. So but they, they'd stop at, Dean, uh, at Main Street to, to wait for the traffic, and the cars would line up probably halfway down Dean Avenue. It was really something. So. But that's one of my memories of the Thompson Press. So, let's begin. First thing I'd like to do is, uh, I'd like to tell you that the Franklin Register was the, uh, the first newspaper in the town of Franklin. And uh, it was followed by the Franklin Sentinel. And I get a lot of my information from the Franklin Sentinel. Uh, they, were, they, they were published between 1878 and 1978. And they're online, so uh, it's really handy to be able to access them. Stanley Chilson collection of films and pictures, uh, you'll see a lot of those. Sanborn fire insurance maps, they kind of helped me to find out where the footprints of buildings are like uh, uh, insurance maps. And then personal pictures and postcards that people have shared with me. So, and of course, the Franklin Museum, great place to be. Uh, I always like to shout it out because uh, you know, they do wonderful things here. A lot of good uh, displays and things. So, Snow, Bassett, and Company. Here's a newspaper clipping that was in the July 30th, 1886 Franklin Sentinel. And it was it said that the Westboro Chrono type uh, company, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was, that was a newspaper. The, the Chrono type was, they, they said that Mr. Snow, Bassett, and Company of Franklin were about to double their capacity for making straw goods. And they were about to build a new straw factory 203 feet long, 40 feet wide, and four stories high. And it looks like brisk times are ahead to see such building operations. So a lot of these newspaper clippings here, you know, they had these cute little things that they would say. That it's kind of funny. You know. And then on August 6th, they said there's plenty of animation down behind the trees beyond the soap factory. Now the soap factory was at the end of Dean Avenue on the right, uh, right at the end of Dean Avenue. Uh, a guy named Summers, uh, Rudolph Summers had that soap factory there. So they said um, a lot of, uh, behind, the, beyond the, behind the trees, beyond the soap factory, where Mr. N Mr. Nelson Corbin, with upwards of a dozen men, are rapidly pushing ahead the excavation and the foundation walls for the new factory of Snow, Bassett, and Company. Big blocks of Milford granite are scattered about picturesquely <laughs> on being Un, un, uh, unloaded from platform cars, I mean, the, the side track the railroad was right there, and a derrick is in position to hoist these blocks into place, and the work is progressing, and as if those engaged meant business. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> so, uh, and if the weather is favorable, there seems to be no reason why the letter of the of the contract should not be carried out, and the building's ready in the first of November. Uh, this is August, and they're saying they're going to be ready in November? Wow. I mean, this is 1886. But, hey. So, Mr. D.C. Cotton was staking out on Alpine Street, and the other, a seller, he was going to put in a cottage on Dean Avenue, or Dean Street, they called it back then. Uh, that was Daniel C. Cotton. He had a piece of property up on Emmons Street, and, in fact, I'll show it to you on the next map, the next thing. Um, you see them in the circle down near the near the bottom. It says D.C. Cotton. And that's um, that's the corner of actually they call it Alpine Street until 1930, but that was Hillside Road today. But on that corner, he built three houses, and he also built one down on Dean Avenue. You can see the smaller circle down on Dean Avenue. That was also D.C. Cotton, Daniel C. Cotton. And up on top, the big big circle. You can see Snow Bassett Straw Works. That was the what it was going to become the Thompson Press. And then you can see the soap factory with the small circle to the right of that. And you can see the engine house and the train table for the railroad. Way over in the far left, you can see the Franklin Water Tower. That was the first water tower that was built. And that was built around 1886, so that they just made it to this map. I think the second tower was built in the 20s, I think. I could be wrong on that. I haven't, I haven't really found anything to tell me when they built it. I'm pretty sure the, big, the bigger of the two tanks is the newer one. 
but definitely that one was there in 1886. So, and then I noticed that uh, the land, which says number 40, but the land was owned by an H.V. Snow. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's any coincidence, it could be, but uh, that um, the straw factory was owned by Snow and Bassett, so maybe he donated some of his land. Yeah, just a, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but uh, there you go. And then, this is Google Earth. That's one thing I love about Google Earth. You know, they, you can zoom in on things, you can, you know, and what, I got really lucky, because a lot of times on Google Earth, what they do is they update with what looks like today. This is an older, older uh, version of, of it before they updated it. So you can still see the Thompson Press in its uh, configuration before they tore it down. Uh, you can see that down the lower, lower part of the picture. And you can see Dean Avenue and Hillside Road. And you can see what, I, what those red uh, symbols, the, the circle is the turn, roughly, I'm kind of guessing where the turntable was, and the engine house. So that's kind of roughly where that was. It was down near the end of Alpine Place, at the corner of Alpine Place and Millican Avenue. But you can see the Thompson Press buildings. Uh, so, yeah. Then in October, now October, now this is what, uh, three months after they started construction, there was progress. The appearance of things at the, snow, the, new, the new shop of Snow Bassett is rapidly, rapidly changing. A part of the fourth and upper floor story of the main building is on, and the work of piping the structure has begun. So they're, they're really moving. The dye, and by, the dye and bleach house is boarded, and the roof is in, and the brick boiler house is nearly completed. Sewage will be taken away in a drain laid from the rear of the factory along the railroad bank to a swamp some distance away. Okay. Wow. No EPA back then. <laughs> wow. Oh, boy. And then a well, was, a well was begun this week, and when they went down five feet, it contained a foot of water. So, wow, that's great. But it will be carried seven, several feet lower. The foundation for the stable is ready. And for the sills, um, let's see. And the chimney for the establishment is to be 70 feet high. One thing that, I, I think I got it on here, but Stanley Chilson was down there about, I think it was 1937, I think. They were repairing it, and the guys were up there. I'm pretty sure I got that on here. And uh, so, yeah. And then Snow Bassett and company have begun putting up the barn at their new factory. Now we're into November. And the tall chimney of the, the, tall chimney of the boiler house has been completed and the staging has been taken down. So you know, they're making a lot of progress. And then uh, they have these drawings of uh, the town of Franklin. And this is a drawing from 1888, and it shows the building in its original configuration. Um, and this is how it was originally constructed. And you can see with the chimney and the, the powerhouse and um, the original building. And then at some point, they added on to it. So the, uh, the diagram, of the detail on the left is the way they originally built the thing. That was in 1880, that's the 1889 map. But if you notice, uh, the, the one on the right is from 1899, and that one shows that they've added on two, diff, two different things. On the front, they added on a small little extension, and on the left, they added, they added a larger extension. Uh, and the, what I read in the, in, the, in the Sentinel was that these additions gave the building some much needed stability, which the original building lacked. So, yeah. Now here's the front of the building, and you can see the, 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 on, the, on the side on the left, that was that new addition that was added there. And I put those red lines to show the original building, and you can see on the right was that expansion. And so there you go. This was taken in 1905. Now in 1905, the Golding Company of Boston purchased the building, which they reinforced for heavy machinery, and which they started to manufacture printing presses, paper cutters, and card cutters. And uh, in 1918, the American Type Founders Company took over the building as a temporary manufacturing unit. The red lines, are, as I said, they highlight what the building looked like before. Uh, there you go. And then here's a nice color picture of it. This was taken around, I think, in the 40s. Uh, in 1926, the company was taken over by the Thompson National Press Company, which manufactured heavy printing presses, paper cutters, and creases. 
their products were sold all over the world. Okay, now I'm going to show, ah, here we go, I'm going to show you the video. This is them repairing the chimney. <laughs> Watch the staging, you're going to love this. Oh, I hope they, hope they don't cut it off. Hey, Stanley Chilson, unbelievable. He was everywhere. I mean, I mean, wow. And then I can remember the tar truck would lay down the tar on, on the ground, and then they would come by. They would come by with a dump truck filled with sand. They'd raise up the dump thing, and they'd go backwards so that they were driving on the sand as they were going backwards. And then, and then uh, that was that's how they treated the roads back then. It's like wow. I remember them doing it on Dean Avenue. This is from 1957, so I would have been about eight years old back then. Uh, this is probably the day that they were doing it. And I, uh, there it is. Yeah. Now, in 1934, November of 34, there was a, a fire in the Thompson Press, and Stanley Chilson was there because he lived about two houses away from there, anyways. Uh, but he went everywhere for you know if there was a fire. He was like a fire photographer, as they called it. But here's where. Uh, he took these pictures, this one and the next one, and uh, they did some damage to the building, but apparently not so much to, I mean, they had to fix the damage, but it wasn't too, too bad. And then there's another picture that was taken during the fire. And then after the, the next, this is about a day or two after the fire, and you can see the damage must have been confined to the building to the left. So. And, this was taken, I took these pictures uh, just about before it was ready to be demolished. About, well, how many, five or six years ago now, I think. But yeah, I went around the building and I took all kinds of pictures and a couple of videos because I knew it was going to be torn down, so I wanted to really get down there and uh, take it down, I would take, take the pictures. I went around the back, took those pictures. Did anybody ever work here? Did anybody here work at Thompson Press or anything? You did? Oh, okay. How, what years did you work? 60, 67. 60, 67? Yeah, yeah well. Just when they started to go down, you stand, they, were, they were laying off people at that time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Leonard Remington? Yeah. Okay. Oh, he was the plant manager. Oh, okay. They're reduced by seniority. Yeah, that's, that's typical. Was, was there a union there? Yeah, oh, okay. So that's, yeah, I, I worked at Clark Cutler, and when they had a layoff, they went uh, by seniority. The newest guys would be the first out, but they were the first ones back in if there was a recall. Yeah. Yes? Uh, Joe, John was kind enough to bring his old union book. A union book? Ooh. Uh, if anybody's interested, if they pass it around, John, or if they have to stay Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, John Brothers, yeah, John Brothers Union book. He's gonna, we're going to pass it around. It's a little fragile. Oh, fragile? Okay. Yeah. Why don't you, John, you don't mind hanging around for a couple of minutes afterwards? And you, can, you can hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Here's a video, here's a video I took down there. There's no sound. Sorry. <laughs> There's really nothing to, nothing to pick up anyways, just, uh, but, yeah. Oh, actually, I can hear a little bit. There was a train going by at the time. <laughs> but, yeah, that building was, was really in bad shape. What year? Uh, 
got to be at least what four or five four or five years. Was it? 2018. Okay. Yeah. Well, six years, seven years. Yeah. Ah, this is uh, Google Earth, and again, it was take. It, uh, luckily, it was before the um, before they re-updated it. And uh, oh, you can see Franklin Lumber in the back, or uh, Franklin Homes, I should say. Franklin Lumber is up on the cent West Central Street. But you can see, of course, yeah, today that's all all new apartment buildings. And then they started demolishing it. <laughs> and isn't it ironic? Now, you know, for, well, for, uh, let me just stop, for, uh, say this first. You look at the, uh, the, the picture to the left is what the building looked like. And you can see the windows. You can see the, the ones in the middle. And then when they, um, over the years, they filled in the, some of those windows, especially the ones in the middle, and they put modern windows. But then when they started tearing it down, they exposed what the original building, uh, the original windows used to look like. And isn't it ironic that the last part of the, very last part of the building that were taken down was the first part that was put up. Isn't that something? You, know, you see that when they tore down the, the piece on the, the side of the building on the right, that, that uh, the, the, the only thing that was left was the original part of the building. <laughs> I thought that was really something, yeah. You know, I live in North Attleboro, and they just tore down a big mill on uh, Broadway in North Attleboro. And this reminds me of that. I was, I was watching them tear that down. Yeah. And then that's what that's what when they finished it. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, I think straw hats and things like that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think it was straw hats and other products and things because straw hats were a very big thing back then, and straw bonnets and things. Pretty sure that that's what it was. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, Scott, you want to come over? We'll, uh, Scott's going to take over, and let me set that up for you. Again, uh, before I jump into this, any more questions for Joe? He gets two dollars and twenty-three cents for every question he answers, <laughs> and from what he told me at the beginning, he needs the money. I'll donate it to So, uh, first of all, show of hands, uh, who was able to come in and see the uh, the train exhibit this year? So nobody. Okay, great. Um, uh, that's heartening. I, I, I appreciate it. The uh, Historical Museum appreciates it. Uh, so this is, as some of you know, uh, this is at least a, a three-year project to uh, capture the, the railroad and its surrounds in, in Franklin circa 1932. And uh, some portions of this are, well, they're all hard, uh, but sometimes for different reasons. Uh, when I decided that I wanted to recreate uh, the, the Thompson Press building, uh, the first person I turned to was Joe. Uh, first of all, because he owes me money. Uh, $2.23, yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, Joe has, has been essential through this process, and, and I knew that, that Joe had information that would be um, close to his, his computer and, and easily sent to me, and I, I wasn't disappointed. I think I sent him an email at about 8 o'clock on a Sunday night, and I, I said, Joe, do you have any pictures of Thompson Press? And he wrote back immediately, and he said, uh, hang on, let me see what I have. Now, this was, he was setting me up big time. Uh, he proceeded to send me nine emails that all had somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 18 photographs in it. Uh, what I didn't know is, and you saw a couple of the pictures that, that Joe took um, before and, and during uh, the uh, takedown of the building. Joe took, I don't know, 17,000 pictures of, of the building, or close, 16, yeah, I knew it was close to that, and sent me all of them. Uh, and, and that information was critical uh, in, in me being able to um, build a, a scale replica of this, of this building. So 
And then to add to that, uh, I knew that, that there was a locomotive roundhouse across the tracks from it. Now, nobody, as far as I know, unless they're very, very old, remembers that, that roundhouse. Uh, we believe it was torn down either in the late 30s or very early 1940s. Uh, it was an obsolete structure um, very early on in the process. Uh, so, and, and subsequently, there wasn't a lot of information to be found um, with regards to it. So, here are my sources. Um, like Joe, uh, I make good use of the Sanborn fire insurance maps. Uh, they're critical because what they show uh, is uh, in each edition of these maps, the different, different uh, variations of what a building looked like. Now, are they 100% accurate? Not always, uh, but they're, they're close enough and if a building isn't there anymore, who can argue? Uh, so the closest we were able to come is the 1927 Sanborn maps, and that showed me, based on, you know, if I based it on 1932, pretty close to what would have been there at the time. So I was pretty confident that what I was building, uh, based on the 27 Sanborn map, was what was there in 1932. Um, again, uh, Google Earth um, is an amazing um, example. Um, interest, it's interesting that if you go on Google Earth today, and I was on it last night, so unless they changed it this morning, Thompson Press still exists as far as Google Earth is concerned. Uh, obviously, any photos of the structures and surrounding areas are critical, and again, Joe was, was essential. Uh, there are really only two photographs of the locomotive roundhouse. Uh, they were taken a year apart, uh, one in 19, uh, I'm sorry, they were taken 10 years apart, one in 1923, one in uh, 1933 and they don't show much change at all in that facility. And then if possible, um, field measurements. I like to go out if the building still exists uh, or if you know, I can get into the area where the building existed, I like to go out there with a tape measure and my camera and see what I can find. Um, I am not an archeologist. I do play one on TV. Thank you for watching. Uh, so uh, amateur archeology, archaeological site work is also very important in this process, especially uh, in the case of the roundhouse, um, because I wanted to make sure that I cited it as close as possible um, in conjunction with Thompson Press. Uh, I wanted these exhibits to be as accurate as possible, because there's always someone that will come in and say, that's not right. So, Again, here is you know, basically the same um, Sanborn map that, that John showed you, except this one is from 1927, and I apologize that it probably looks a little small up there. But again, you can see the locomotive roundhouse on the right side of the tracks, and as you work your way up or north, or in the case of the railroad east, uh, you're heading towards Boston. Thompson Press is on the left. And again, based on 1927, I've got a pretty good idea of, of what was there. And here's a, a screenshot of Google Earth. Now, the great thing about Google Earth for me is that once I compare it to the 1927 Sanborn maps, I can go to Google Earth and I can pick out what was there and what wasn't in 1932. So if you look at the, the portion of the building in the, in the northwest corner there, um, none of that existed in 1932. So, of course, that made the building process easier for me. I didn't have to build it. But the other thing that Google Earth allows me to do is it has a measuring function. And it's actually very accurate. So all you do is, is, is uh, start a point on one corner of the building and run it to the next corner and deduct, in this case, for roof overhang, two feet. And I know how long a wall is. So when, see, you, you learn something from me. That'll be the first and last time that ever happens. Um, so again, when you're trying to build something to scale accurately, that's a, that's a critical piece, because obviously I couldn't go and measure that building. It wasn't there. Uh, so when Joe says in his data that that building is 203 feet long, he is absolutely correct. That building was 203 feet long and 40 feet wide. Um, so I was able to work my way around the building and get all of the critical measurements that I needed. And that made the, that made the process so much easier. Is that the same program? 
been a house shingle this year, and they have a, a, a special program to figure out the footage of the house. I wonder if that's the same program they use. It's quite possible. Yeah, yeah so they, they, they know exactly how big the house is and how many shingle packages of shingles are going to need. What, I'm not a, a math guy. My degree is in journalism, which qualifies me for a job in sales. <laughs> but it amazes me that, you know, you can zoom in and off of this image, and you're still getting the same. It knows what the, of course, it's GPS, so I guess that makes sense. So here's the, the roundhouse uh, from June of 1933. And, and although this shows us really only two sides of the building, it actually offered up enough information for me to build this um, to scale based on uh, information that I already know about roundhouses in general. Yes, sir? So what is a roundhouse? What is it used in a maintenance facility? It, so it's a locomotive maintenance facility, and, it's, and a roundhouse is paired with a turntable. Turntable sits in front of the roundhouse, the locomotive pulls onto the turntable, and the turntable spins and it lines up with an open stall, and then the locomotive pulls into the roundhouse. Now, they're, they're, roundhouses have different functions. They can purely be for storage. They can be for storage and light maintenance, or in some cases on larger railroads and, and hubs, they can be storage and heavy maintenance. Uh, this one was mostly for storage. I don't think there was a lot of maintenance going on there. You see, on the right-hand side of that building on the long wall, you see a bump out. And on my model, I built that as a machine shop uh, because I, I thought it was more interesting and who's going to argue with me. More than likely, it was a stores warehouse. Uh, I don't think they did a lot of maintenance in this building. In fact, I don't really think that, especially with regards to the building itself, there was much maintenance done at all. Uh, I, in fact, I'm pretty certain that the definition of deferred maintenance was invented based on this building. Sure. So the, these, were, these were tall buildings for a couple of reasons. One, you're absolutely right. When you, when you measure a, a steam locomotive from the rails to the top of the stack, and that stack could be of different configurations and sizes, it had to get through the door. But the other thing, too, is that if they didn't build the roof high enough, the smoke from the locomotives would collect, and you wouldn't be able to see or breathe or anything. Um, this particular building had to be a little slice of hell on earth to work in, and, and here's why. Um, I've, I've been in the hobby of model railroading, and I, and I consider myself a railroad historian. Um, I've been in the hobby since I was four years old. I've, I've seen and researched hundreds of locomotive roundhouses. This is the only one I've ever seen that was clad in tin. And there's a theory um, that, that Joe and I derived, I'm gonna pull you into this whether you like it or not, um, Harry Haywood donated the money to build this locomotive roundhouse. The reason he did that was because back then, in the winter, locomotives uh, had to run backwards into Boston. Now, a lot of Haywood's employees came from other towns other than Franklin. And if, you, if you're familiar with how steam locomotives work, they have an open cab and then a tender full of coal and water, and in the old days wood. Uh, and if you were running backwards in the winter, you were open to the elements. So, you know, if it was snowing, if it was freezing, you know, you, too bad. So what happened a lot, in a lot of cases is if the weather was really bad, the trains wouldn't run. So Harry's employees couldn't get to the mill, and consequently it was costing him money. He donated money and, and the land to build this roundhouse, but he probably didn't donate enough money. <laughs> and the railroad said, okay, we'll build you a roundhouse, but we're not going to spend a penny out of our pockets. Now, most roundhouses I've ever seen, all roundhouses I've ever seen, except this, are either brick, stone, or wood. This is whatever the stud walls were, probably two by eights or two by sixes, and then they nailed tin panels, um, four by six foot tin panels right over it. Can you imagine, and by the way, there are only eight windows in this entire building. Can you imagine what that must have been like in July or January? Um, you know, and on top of that, you've got the, the smoke from the locomotives, which even with a high roof, 
probably still was a little bit of an impediment. Oh, just, yeah, I mean, they were, they were basically, you know, tea kettles, giant tea kettles. So, so the heat that they must have um, emitted was, was probably almost unbearable. Have you been to the one in Plainville? Yes. So for those of you who are interested, there is a, a brick locomotive roundhouse that the New Haven Railroad built that's still standing in Plainville on West Bacon Street. Uh, an oil company bought it several years ago, and they use it to store their trucks, but you can drive in there. It's a dirt road access in there. And you can see, you know, what an actual, and, and this building is beautiful. The brickwork on it is fairly ornate. Uh, you can see the remnants of the foundation of the turntable buried in the ground. And it's kind of interesting to think how that operation um, all worked. That's in Plainville on West Bacon Street. So if you're on uh, 1A, heading towards North Attleboro, and you get to the lights where the bookstore is on the left, if you take a right there, and go down about a quarter of a mile, it'll be on your left. Okay. Right before you go over the bridge, there's a little bridge there. Um, and, and as an aside, another interesting piece to this picture is you see that passenger car that's, that's uh, to the left of the building. At that time, it was being used as crew quarters or you know, some type of storage. Um, we believe that that passenger car, if you notice, it's white. We believe, and, and based on the, the, the age of that passenger car, which I can confirm goes back to the 1800s, that that was part of the white train uh, that the New York and New England Railroad ran from Boston to New York City. Um, and that was, that was probably more than likely one of the remnants of that train. So if you, if you are standing in the roundhouse area and you turn to the right, uh, in this case is Golding Manufacturing Company, um, soon to be Thompson Press. This is, to me, this is the seminal picture um, in, in this presentation uh, because, first of all, it, it's such a high quality picture, probably taken with an 8x10 view camera, uh, and it shows so much information, not only about Golding Manufacturing or Thompson Press, but about the roundhouse and turntable facility. So the, f the first thing is, and I don't know how clearly you can see this, but Joe showed a video of them fixing the smokestack, the chimney. Take a look at the face of that smokestack. There is a crack that must run 40 feet oh, yeah. that runs vertically up that thing. Um, so, you know, again, these were the days before OSHA, before the EPA, uh, before even building inspectors. You could pretty much do whatever you wanted and get away with it. Lord only knows how long that smokestack, and it, as you can see, there's smoke coming out of it, so it's completely operational. Um, but that's a collapse waiting to happen. And this picture was taken shortly after the turn of the 1900s. I, th I think this is probably 1904, 1905. And the reason I know that is because of the age of the freight cars in here. The other piece of information, well, a couple. Uh, so you see the fire escape. That fire escape lasted until they tore the building down. So that was, it, it, so if they put it up the day before this picture was taken, it was still well over 100 years old. Now, let's face it, the building was probably a fire trap. I can't imagine needing to climb down that fire escape in, you know, 2004, knowing that that fire escape was 100 years old at that point. No, they're, no, you're jumping out a window, yeah. And, and let me tell you that there's stuff down below there that would impede your fall eventually before you even got to the ground. The last thing I want to point out in this picture, which makes it completely fascinating for me, is that this was clearly during the construction of um, the, the water. Uh, the, there, there was a water column that serviced the locomotives there. The reason I know that is because on the left you can see a stack of pipes, flanged pipes. Now what's interesting about this, beside the fact that it tells me that, that, that it was replacing a water tank that was there, was that water came from the water tower that was across from the station, almost a half a mile away. And they ran that pipe down from the water tank, underground, along the tracks, all the way to where the turntable was, where it, where it fed that water column. So. Uh, so, and I, I suspect that, that the photograph was taken for one of two reasons. One, because someone was filing an insurance claim about this chimney. 
or someone was curious about what they were building down there and saw the pipe. Uh, this area was not easy to get into. Uh, the access to it was off of Alpine Place. And if you, if you drive down Alpine Place and you get to the sharp right-hand turn, you will see straight ahead a dirt road that goes down and to the left. And that's how you, if you worked at that roundhouse, that's how you got there. So here, here are two more pictures. The, the one on the bottom left is one that Joe showed uh, in his presentation. But again, it gave me information in terms of how many windows, uh, the type of window it was. This was a basic six over six mill window. Uh, there is a company that was kind enough to make it in plastic. So that made my life a lot easier. Um, so all I had to do was match up the window, um, buy 400 of them, and paint and put glass in every single one of them. But that's, that's on me. The, the picture to, to the t right at the top is also a, a very early picture before Thompson Press. What interested me about this picture under the heading of what was there and what wasn't there in 1932, is you'll notice on the extension to the left is a clear story on the top of the building. And that didn't exist in, in, on the 1927 Sanborn map, and it certainly didn't exist in later years either. But that was one way that, uh, you know, before um, the standardization of electricity, that, that buildings brought light in by opening up the roof and putting in extra windows. This picture on the bottom left, the one that Joe already showed, it, it, the thing I find interesting about it is, look at that telephone pole. Uh, y you know, you wonder why these buildings burnt down. Uh, I don't care what anybody says, that's just not safe. Uh, and there are other telephone poles to the left, none of them are straight. Uh, they've all, the, the one on the right's got five arms hanging off it. You can only imagine, you know, how many wires and how much electricity was going into that building at that time. So again, this, this picture shows me um, the roof lines. Uh, from, that, from this information, I can determine not only the type of window and door, but how far the spacing was apart. And that's a combination of using the math from Google Earth, uh, using the math from that window, and then a little bit of guesswork to say, well, OK, the spacing between those windows is less than the width of the windows. And this is how many windows I need to get in a, on a wall. And I know how wide the wall is. So you, you, you throw a bunch of numbers into a calculator, and it, it gives you your spacing. So based on that information, um, I'm going to hold it there for a second. But based on that information, I can draw everything out in CAD, import it to a laser cutter, and with wood buildings, there are companies that make sheets of, of basswood. This is inscribed with clapboard uh, that's spaced 1 16th of an inch apart, which equals 6 inches in 1 87th scale. So I feed that, that sheet wood into the machine, and it cuts all of my, my wall dimensions, all of my window openings, all of my door openings. And then it's just a question of just a question of gluing all the pieces together um, over about 300 hours of work. Um, lastly, again, like I said, when I can, I, I really enjoy going out on field trips. Sometimes this is easier. Um, sometimes it's, it's harder. In this case, getting down to where the where roundhouse and, and turntable was, it was, was fairly difficult. It's all overgrown, as you might imagine. You need to, if you're going down there, you need to go down when there's no foliage on the trees. Um, not only can you see better, but also, um, you know, the, the brambles aren't in full bloom and, and you're not, you know, tripping and, and scraping yourself up. So what I saw down there were, were a couple of important things. The picture on the left shows one of the foundation blocks for the roundhouse, and there were several of those. Uh, there weren't any, you know, it was... It was a piece of junk building, so the tin was reclaimed and, and probably sold or reused. Um, you know, there was no real wood left over. The picture on the right was, a, was a, a very important picture. This is the water column that I was talking about earlier. As you can see, it's still there, uh, minus its, its lateral arm. But knowing where that was, knowing where it is, allowed me to set that um, Roundhouse and turntable exactly where it was in conjunction to Thompson Press. 
Um, I didn't point it out, but in the in the, the picture of the roundhouse, you can see the water column uh, standing there. So the picture on the left, when I looked at, uh, there were also railroad valuation maps. And based on those maps, I could see the number of, of track configurations. I could see any sidings that were in the area. And locomotive roundhouses and, and engine facilities have or had what are called ash pits. So when a locomotive came in off of a run, they would have to dump their ashes from the coal that they burned. And they would, they would go out on a separate track. Usually there was a, basically a hole in the ground. They'd open the firebox, and the ashes would dump into, the, in, into this concrete pit. And then someone, um, the low man on the totem pole, would, um, with a shovel and a wheelbarrow, shovel them up and take them away. When I was down in this area, I, I couldn't. I, I could see on the map where this ash pit track was, but when I was down there, I couldn't reconcile how that could be because the land drops off by about 12 feet. So it, it just didn't make any sense to me. Nobody, after they tore out the roundhouse, nobody came in with a bulldozer and dug out that land. And by the way, it goes on for eternity, evidently. But I did find a, uh, these um, concrete pads on the left here. And I couldn't figure out what they could be, or how they could be there, or, or what it was, but it, it seemed reasonable that based on where I was, it was somewhat railroad related. When I went back and looked at the map, I realized that that ash pit went out on a trestle. And these pads held up the, the footings, the legs of the trestle. Again, under the heading of no EPA, this trestle bordered a stream. The stream is still there, and you can see the stream on the map, and you can stick your fingers and toes in the stream now if you want. They were literally dumping the ashes into the stream. So just like Thompson Press or Golding or, or Snow and Bassett, they were, they were dumping you know, whatever they wanted into that, that waterway that went out into you know, what's now Delcarts. Um, same thing here. That, this stream inevitably ends up at Delcarts, and you know, there's probably still a lot of ash sediment on the bottom. Uh, on the right is a picture of an old railroad tie that I found in the woods there. Uh, probably hasn't been touched or moved for 70 or 80 years. Um, so you know, those are some of the, the things you can find and get at least some sense of how you're going to interpret um, what was reality versus what you're about to build. Um, any questions on, on this so far? So that was this past year's exhibit, the year before we did the train station in the center of town. What's next? This is what's next. This is, this is, uh, this is called my Waterloo. Uh, <laughs> so under pros and cons, uh, the, the good news is the building still exists. Um, I've been down there a hundred times with a tape measure and a laser measure and my camera, uh, much to the chagrin of Margaret Murray, uh, who owns the mill. Um, but it, it allows me the opportunity again to match up that 1927 Sanborn map uh, with Google Earth and now my own measurements so that I can accurately reproduce this. Uh, this is a challenge for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, again, the good news is it still exists. The bad news is it's a huge brick building. Uh, this will be by far the largest model construction project I've ever done. And I've been building buildings for a long, long time. Uh, every single building, uh, window in this building, and there are six different types of, of windows, all had to be um, CAD drawn individually. There are no commercial windows like the one that's getting passed around um, for me to buy and, and make my job easy. Uh, and I don't have that level of expertise with CAD. I've got a good friend who's been essential throughout this three-year process who's doing the, the heavy lifting with the CAD work, and he just finished the, the sixth window. But it's been, um, and we started working on this in December. So this is, it's a major, major undertaking. Um, uh, so I'm looking at the windows, I see the brickwork is kind of 
kind of like an arch on the Yeah. So I see the arch on the top. So the original window, I assume, would, would fit that space. But in later years, it looks like they put on the, the smaller windows with, you know, with the plywood that gets there. It, it's interesting to note that um, there are still some original windows from the 1870s. So you, can you assume that those were the type of windows that were there making the job easier? So, and it, so now, right, there's choices to be made. Um, because there are still some examples of some original windows, what do I choose to, to model? Uh, so, uh, again, Joe was kind enough to send me a whole bunch of pictures of Thompson Press, and, and I was able to determine that um, these windows, and you can see one of the windows um, that's probably most accurate for the time period that, that we're modeling here to the right of the bump out, the entranceway, that has just the small white arch at the top. So on the, on the newer parts of the mill, that's what I'm, I'm building, but on the old original parts of the mill, I'm, I'm modeling the window that has the full arch window to it. So um, am I 100% accurate? I don't know. Uh, it's the best I can do, Joe. <laughs> um, and, and there are a couple of, of pictures of, of my field work and uh, one of the things that you notice here is is the different colors in the bricks the the building in the le on the left the annex on the left is lighter and that's actually a, a newer part of the building than the building on the right which is the which is what I what I'm calling annex one um, the, the, the brick is more of a darker brown color uh, so those are all things that I'm trying to capture when I when I uh, actually start to glue pieces of wood together. And then lastly, um, again, just as a preview, uh, this is the, the track side of the building, the Midland Division mainline side of the building. And you can see uh, the picture on the left is the original mill that was built in the 1870s. And then the uh, picture on the right is uh, the, the newer uh, portion of the building that was built at the turn of the 1900s, and then the last portion of it was built, uh, completed in 1928. And you can see that not only is it a bigger um, portion of the building in terms of height, um, size of the windows, so on and so forth, uh, but also the, the brickwork is more ornate. So, you know, probably um, uh, the Haywood family had a little more money in those days, business was good and they didn't spare the money for, for you know, the uh, more elaborate brickwork. So that's what's coming up. Hopefully in December, that goes on display. Um, I say hopefully because uh, until I start actually cutting, laser cutting wood and gluing, gluing it together, I'm, I'm just not gonna have a sense of the, the timing of this thing because it's so big. In conjunction with this as part of that exhibit, uh, I'll also be including the Franklin Paint Complex, which back then was the Franklin Yarn Company. Uh, I don't have pictures of that, but again, if you go down Cottage Street Extension, you can, you can certainly see it on the right. The wonderful thing about that is that most of that complex existed in 1932. So it's fairly easy uh, to um, get the information that I need um, in order to build this thing. What did they manufacture? What did they manufacture? At the mill store? Yeah. So uh, uh, different stuff over the years. Um, and stuff is a technical term that I like to throw out. I'm, so, um, originally one of the products was called Satinet. And Satinet was a, a silky material that they used to line hats with, straw hats. Um, they also used it to line caskets, um, among other things. So there was a pretty wide array of, of uses for it in those days. In later years it became um, strictly a, a woolen mill. And they made, they made um, woolen textiles there. Um, interestingly enough, as I was doing my research, there's, there's really three main sections to this building. And the last section, which was built early on in the, in the, in the construction process, was what they called their dye houses. And Franklin Yarn abuts this building. In fact, it encroaches on it. Um, it there was no building code in those days, so if you, if you actually went down there and looked at how this all meshes together, you'd think, how, how the heck did this pass muster? Uh, there's a sluice way that runs in between the, the buildings, and Franklin Yarn's buildings that were closest to this sluice way were also their dye houses, coincidentally, 
or not. And again, if you're standing on these tracks and you look down there, you'll see that sluiceway and you'll see the clay pipes that come out from the retaining walls. And literally what they did was they took the buckets of dye and they dumped them into a hole in the concrete floor, emptied out into the sluiceway that runs into the wetlands behind the mill that's now the apartments on the other side of the tracks. Again, no EPA. Um, so to me, that's, that's a, an interesting talking point and an interesting piece to model. So that, that's going to be a part of this whole exhibit next year, being able to show that. Um, yes, Roger. Um, oh. So, it, so it, it's in the museum's collection. Um, Joe also has that, that picture in his collection. Uh, so, uh, you know, among the, the three or 400 others that, that we have. There, so, you know, there were a couple of prominent mills in, in Franklin, the, the Haywood Mill obviously being one of them, um, Thompson Press being, being another. Uh, so they would have been photographed probably more often than the, the smaller, um, sweatshop type places that, that also existed at that time. I wanted to point out um, that, uh, again, when I was down at the, the Roundhouse facility, um, just like the year before when I was looking for information on the coal company across from the, the station uptown, I, I found some remnants of, of business as it took place down there. I found some coal, and I don't know how well you can see this, but does anyone know what this is? It looks like coal. It's called a clinker. And anybody who heated their house with coal back in the day knows what a clinker is. It's, it's basically the byproduct of, of coal. It's the part of the coal that doesn't burn off and it tended to stick to furnaces. It, it stuck to fireboxes and steam locomotives and they used to have to go in there with a big, big long steel pole and, and break it off. So I'm gonna pass this around. What makes this unique compared to the coal I found last year was that at, at the coal dealership, that was hard coal, that was anthracite coal. They used that for home and business heating because it burned cleaner. This is soft coal, this is bituminous coal. There was much more of it, it was much cheaper. But you know those pictures you see of the steam locomotives with the smoke billowing out of the smokestacks? Well that's because they were burning the, the worst grade, lowest possible, highest uh, sulfur coal that they could get their hands on because it was dirt cheap. So it was interesting to note that, uh, you know, there's still uh, remnants of, of that operation down there. Uh, that's my last slide. Any questions, comments? Yes, Roger. That previous uh, photo that you had where it had the end of the building, it almost looks like that some of the brick that was a little lighter color. Do you think that was, those were windows that were bricked in? In some cases it was. And, and that was that was one of the things that took me the longest in my research is determining, um, you know, where there were windows that aren't now. There were a lot of doors that were cut into that that brickwork over the years as pieces of the mill were sublet. Um, new tenants needed access to certain spaces. Now the way the mill is configured now, there's kind of a a back portion of it that you can't even get to. It's not even open now. The only way you can get to it is by walking through one of the additions that's been built. The problem with that is that, um, again, when this mill was built, there was a well that was dug out back. And that well served a couple of purposes. One, it provided water um, for the dye houses, but also it was for fire suppression. And they built, um, again, a tin clad, octagonal enclosure over this well that was insulated with, well, what would you insulate with back then? Oh, asbestos. Um, that universal material that's even a great dessert topping. So about 10 years ago, that building finally collapsed. And when it did, the asbestos got into the sluiceway and it ran into the wetlands. Um, so there's been a little bit of a, an issue with who's responsible for the cleanup, how you even clean it up. Uh, somehow Margaret Murray uh, managed to get the, the enclosure cleaned up and out of there. I don't know how she did it because there's literally no access and it must have been heavy equipment that needed to get back there. Um, so she's a little leery about anybody um, 
from the town poking around back there. Um, we've had a couple of conversations about basically what the heck I'm doing and why I would be doing it. Um, so anybody that knows Margaret, please tell her I'm a great guy, um, even if you have to lie a little bit. Um, so, uh, so in conjunction with this project, I just want to add, um, before we wrap this up, um, Joe and I are working on a potential documentary for this. Um, we think it's a, a big enough project to warrant it. Yes, ma'am. So interesting enough, it's, it's still one of those wood sheets, except that it's laser cut with a brick pattern. So, and then it's the same process. I, I draw out all the walls and window and door openings in CAD, import it to the laser cutter, and feed thousands of dollars worth of these wood sheets through the laser cutter, and it, it cuts all of my openings. In this case, it's a little dif more difficult because as Joe pointed out, there's brick arches over the win windows. There's also granite sills underneath. So those pieces have to be cut out separately and then glued in place in into the window openings. Uh, there, there were 420 or 418 windows in the Thompson Press building. So, in fact, when I bought the windows, the supplier that I got them from, I, I used to manufacture structure kits for the hobby. He thought I was going back into the structure making business again. He couldn't understand why I was buying 400 windows at once. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just wondering how far the tracks go back. Um, so, so, originally, they went to Newburgh, New York. Um, now, um, they only go um, past the bridge um, down to, you know, why do I always... Grove Street, thank you, uh, senior moment. Uh, they only, they, they end at Grove Street now and it becomes the SNET uh, walking trail. So, but, um, you know, back in, up until, well, up, up until the, the 60s, they went to Blackstone. And before that, um, they connected through Hartford to um, Newburgh, New York, and you could, from Hartford, you could get anywhere. So this was, this, these tracks right here, and by the way, in 1927, there were 10 tracks that crossed Union Street. Uh, three that went to the Milford branch to the right, and seven that, that were part of the Midland Division. Uh, and only one of them was the siding track for this mill. So there was, there was a lot of railroading that went along. During World War II, the government rerouted all of the, the military troop trains over the Midland Division as opposed to the shoreline division, which ran through Providence and New London and, and went down the coast that way because they were afraid of submarine attacks. So in Franklin at that point, if you stood on the bridge on, on Main Street over the railroad tracks, you could see 86 trains a day come through Franklin. So it was a major operation. Yes, sir, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, so like, during Joe's presentation, he uh, gave credit to Franklin Sentinel. And I think, Joe, you said that it's amazing. You can go online and you can, can you get access to all the, all their records back to the 1880s even? Of the, uh, the Sentinel? Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. So have, have you used, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of questions about um, how things were done 150 years ago mm -hmm. now almost. Have you used the Franklin Sentinel online to try to get more information about the it's it's a great question no I use Joe um, who uses the Franklin Sentinel um, no I am I'm, I'm blessed in that this is you know I I, I do the, the construction of, of the exhibits but there's so much behind the scenes that goes along so many friends that have that have chipped in to help out um, not the least of which is Joe um, who's been essential but um, you know, again, my friend that does the, the more advanced CAD work, I've got a, a friend who's a member of the uh, New Haven Railroad Historical Society that's been essential in providing me some information. Um, so I haven't needed to do that then. Um, there, there's been enough um, photographic evidence, map evidence, um, anecdotal evidence um, that, I've, that I've been able to, um, to do this without it. And the other piece too is, you know, there's a time factor associated with this. Um, yeah, just as a follow-up, though, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of probably able-bodied students between high school students that have
have to do um, community service work yep. and probably being history students that might be willing to help out with that kind of research online. That's, that's something to keep in mind. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, there, there are a handful of smaller businesses, uh, but um, I would say up until probably four or five years ago, probably 80% of the building was occupied. Uh, Shire Bookstore was in there, and they took up a big chunk of Annex 2. When did they leave? I want to say it was at least five years ago, um, and it may have been a little longer. Um, now it appears that the whole back end of that mill is empty. Yeah, I would, I would suspect so. Um, when I was out there a couple of weeks ago um, explaining to Margaret, again, what I was doing there, um, I noticed that the back portion of that mill, um, the windows had been broken. Um, she's also put up security cameras, which makes a lot of sense because the people down there breaking windows, you know, she, she doesn't need that either. So I, I, my understanding is, and it's, 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 I think it's probably more rumor than anything else, is that she's looking to to sell it. I know that little gift shop Yeah. Yeah, it's down moving down to East Central Street, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes. How does Mayflower check stock for this I remember seeing signs Mayflower check stock. Yeah, they're they're not there anymore. Um uh, was that the new building No, I don't I don't believe it was. And and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Murray family bought it in nineteen forty nine. Margaret is the third generation owner of the family. Her grandfather bought the, bought the mill. It had gone through um, a couple of bankruptcies. Um, uh, was it Harry Vargin, which? Harry, Harry Bullican. Um, ended up with a partner buying it at auction. And I think it was like $39,000 or some, some really ridiculous cheap price. It sold about a few years later. Yep. I think it was 44 when Margaret bought it, I think. Okay. Um, so it, it's changed hands, and I think as, as the, the textile industry in general moved out of, out of the north, um, it opened itself up to, to smaller, different types of businesses. Uh, there was a, an iron worker, iron works in there uh, at one time. Um, there, there's a couple of high, really small high-tech companies that are in there. Um, but. You know, it's it's just a really, really old building, and you know, in five years, who knows where it'll be? Yes. Um, anybody else? I see no hands. Oh. Okay, so we have a video display um, on the the front side of the. This, this, this display cases here. Uh, feel free to take a look. You'll see more pictures of not only the um, diorama, um, but also the, the, the prototype buildings. Um, folks, thank you very much for coming in. And thanks to Joe Landry for his presentation. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.